Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Arteris IP with Kurt Schuler, who's going to talk today about the difference between CXL and C6. So, Kurt, there's a couple of communications architectures that have become very popular, one of which is the uh, Compute Express Link. The other one is the Cache Coherent Interconnect for Accelerators. What's the difference between those two? Okay, so we're talking about uh, CXL and C6. Uh, if you look at in uh, time frame, C6 uh, was defined uh, before CXL. Um, now they both coexist. And so we get asked this uh, question a lot from customers. Hey, you know, what are you seeing, you know, for adoption of CXL and C6? And what are you seeing uh, where these are being used in the market? Um, from uh, there are, there are some technical differences uh, between C6 and CXL, and that uh, then helps determine where they fit into the markets and what their use cases are. You have to think about this upfront too, right? So when you're, whenever you're designing a chip, you need to think about what's the communications architecture you're going to use, and that defines a lot of things in your design as well. That, that's correct. And with these two different standards, uh, one of the things you need to look at is kind of a... Um, a master and slave type architecture versus everything being coherent together architecture. You got to look at what's going to be uh, in the package together versus what's going to be separate chips. Uh, these are the things you have to think about when choosing between these two standards. So why don't you draw this out for us? Okay. So Kurt, what's the genesis of C6 and CXL? So the main idea behind both of these was is really two different uh, uh, requirements is one is how do we scale a uh, 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 SOC across multiple die or multiple chips and then two how do we reuse what uh, existing infrastructure is available especially at the at the file layer which is, is pretty expensive and hard to get right and so uh, both of these standards ride on top of the, the PCIe 5 infrastructure um, what's different is when you go up into um, the uh, protocol layers and some of the transaction layers, uh, there's differences for these standards beyond uh, normal PCIe as well as differences between each other. And so this is basically your architecture for how you're going to construct a multi-chip type of uh, solution, right? Correct. It could be multi-chip or multi-die within the same package. And so the, there, there's differences between these two as far as how they would be used uh, because of the technical differences uh, uh, in their implementation. C6 has been around for a while. What's changed there? What, what did they find that, that that didn't do and why you need CXL? Well, with C6, the idea was that you would have two different either chips or die, and they would be connected through C6. And the idea here is that for both of these different SOCs in here, they would have a common view of memory with each other. So think of this as being one cache coherent system. So um, if you look at the complexity of how you do this, there's, there's no master and no slave uh, here. So in, these two uh, SOCs can snoop each other in the cache coherent domain. So that means that um, you know, the digital logic to do this is pretty complex. Uh, when you look at the genesis of CXL, CXL was meant to solve maybe a little bit simpler problem. So given that you have something like an x86 master chip, how do you attach hardware accelerator chips to it? So in this particular case, you have your Xeon, which is your master, and then you have some kind of perhaps AI accelerator chip here. And this is always a master, this is a slave. So it's, a, it's a simpler from a digital logic standpoint. Where would you use one versus the other? What's the advantage? Um, the advantage of CXL is, uh, from an implementation standpoint, it's, it's a bit simpler. Um, you are automatically assuming that you're going to be you know, a companion chip to something else. So your requirements are more, and your constraints are more narrowly bounded. Here... Um, those assumptions go away. Here, this is a system with two very interdependent SOCs. So more work needs to be done here in kind of the architecture of what you want to do at a system level, where here it's kind of given I'm going to be part of, uh, you know, I'm going to be a slave to the, this other uh, system uh, that reduces your degrees of freedom for design. So with C6, would that work as a redundant type of chip in a, an automotive application, for example? 
Uh, that's not the intent here. Actually, the intent here is scalability. And where we see this is being scalability uh, most likely within uh, a package. So multiple die within a package um, connected together. One common view of, of memory, cache coherent. And um, we see this uh, primarily, I, I expect it'll happen in uh, AI chips uh, that do not uh, require an, an x86. Um, also, some of the automotive chips and scalability for that, because in automotive, you know, there's kind of like these low, medium, and high versions of uh, uh, different systems, and this seems to fit well uh, in, in, into that uh, use case. Well, CXL, is that sort of based on the fact that you have an x86 architecture there, and you, now you can extend that quite a bit? Yeah, it's not required, but that is the assumption here that, you know, you're going to have either an Intel or an AMD uh, chip in, in a, a data center, you know, server type chip. Um, and, you know, having that uh, then provides from a system uh, level standpoint, you know, that, that provides one of the constraints on, you know, what your data flow is going to be, where your processing is going to be. And most likely what you're trying to do is do some hardware acceleration over here that doesn't necessarily work well on, you know, the CPUs over, over here. So these could be things, you know, we, we've seen this all before, away from processing, uh, crazy uh, matrix multiplications, things like that. Which one's easier to work with? From our standpoint, from an interconnect standpoint, uh, because this is more bounded, and from a cache coherency standpoint, when we're uh, dealing with our Encore cache coherent interconnect, um, because this, in essence, is a, is a slave to this, the logic uh, behind this is, is actually a little bit simpler. Uh, whereas with here, um, there, there's more, there's, there's some duplication uh, directories and, you know, a lot, lot of uh, information sharing and state storage uh, that goes on back and forth to maintain coherency throughout these multiple die. So let's take some markets, for example, and say which one would you use where? What would you use C64 versus CXL? Um, I think uh, for C6, if you look at this as being an a inter-die um, uh, protocol, which is what I think it's going to emerge being. This is uh, going to be really interesting, I think, for uh, a lot of AI vendors who are creating these chips. They, they have ARM cores, but a ton of different hardware accelerators, and they want to be able to scale that. So they want to be able to have multiple die and connect them together. Um, and you can do that arbitrarily with uh, C6. So you can see that. You can see that with, um, for example, you've probably seen some of the, um, the block diagrams where you have like the... Um, like a Xilinx hub and C6 connections out here, and then different accelerators attached to it. There's, the, which, which are all different die. So there, there, there's, there's different types of architectures um, that we see in here that where the data flow has to be um, where every die or every chip is an equal citizen, C6 is a, is a good map for that. How about CXL? CXL is more for, hey, you know, given that we have this x86 processing, um, let's be able to, you know, put a put a card, put a line card on there with our AI processing or some other kind of algorithmic processing and put that in the PCIe slots and have that be a slave to those Xeons that are already in that system. So where does the network on chip fit in here? So the network on chip is very important in here because if you think about it, with these two die being coherent with each other, they each have cache coherent interconnects inside and they each have a directory and so these directories and the state of what's going on have to be kept in sync so there's a lot of logic that goes in here to ensure that uh, cache coherence is maintained through this die or through all of these different die or chips in this use case down here over here with cxl and uh, the the ai companion chips these are also very complex. Uh, usually the reason why you're doing this companionship is because you have a ton of different heterogeneous processors on it um, in a, a very different architecture than what you have on those, those Intel or AMD chips. And the interconnects in there are extremely complex. And so that's where you know, our FlexNOC and Encore interconnects also implement the data flow within those chips. Really what you're trying to do is move data through at a, an optimum rate for whatever your your application is, right? Isn't that what all this is about? Exactly. It, it's, about, um, it's about the bandwidth. It's about, uh, in the case of like automotive, where you have new real-time latencies. 
And most importantly, it's about when those two crash into each other. And the interconnect is key to determining how that data flow works within the system so you can simultaneously meet the bandwidth requirements so you're not starving yourself and the latency requirements that you need. Because uh, when, when, um, you know, when you're doing things on the edge uh, here, you know, you, you're dealing with the physical world, which has real-time requirements. How much of this will be done on the edge versus in the cloud? I think that what we're seeing now is um, the processing at the edge is becoming more and more and more. Um, the wireless standards required to uh, send lots of data up into the cloud and get data back from the cloud really don't exist uh, right now. So when you're looking at the automotive side of things or even some of the consumer electronics, we're seeing more and more processing being done on the edge. A lot of this is being driven by this massive data that's coming out of uh, image sensors and uh, cameras, right? Correct. There's, there's the image sensors and cameras. Um, if you look at AI, uh, there's a, a few different things. Where it's from. If you look on the data center side of things, it's being driven by just big data in general coming from anything. So, you know, think of credit card processing, things like that. Every little transaction, every time you swipe, that goes in there, and they make some inference based on that. When you're looking at the edge in consumer electronics, it's, it's uh, voice was the first that was easiest, you know, hey, hey Alexa, um, or, or hey Google. Um, now, vision for many, many things that are, are camera oriented. Cars are becoming more complex, so you're seeing more, um, more different types of sensors. So LIDARs, short range radars, long range radars, you know, of course, ultrasonic. And you're seeing the need for um, separate, what we call sensor fusion functionality, to be able to take all of these different, think of it as senses uh, from that vehicle and be able to put that into a single view of reality around it. And so that's requiring a lot of processing at the edge. Any difference in terms of power, one versus the other? Um, the great thing in the data center is that, you know, it, it plugs into, uh, usually it's some kind of uh, hydroelectric dam somewhere. And uh, so you have a lot of cooling from that cold water and you have a lot of electricity. So, uh, the yes, there, you know, people complain, you build these chips about their, you know, total dissipated power and all these power budgets and stuff but it is nothing compared to what we're seeing here um, in automotive um, as well as consumer electronics. Um, one of the trends we're seeing in automotive is for some of the newer systems, I imagine a lot of them will be liquid cooled. How about security? Any difference one versus the other? Uh, yes, um, a lot of attack surfaces over here. Uh, th there's some new specifications that are, that are coming around about how to deal with security. Uh, it's been separate from functional safety uh, historically, because it is, you know, from a, a PhD level, it's it's a different um, it's a different domain. However, from an effects standpoint, there's similar um, uh, uh, results from whether it's active Doug or active God. So um, security is becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, things are easier to protect behind the big firewalls that you have in the data center. Not always so easy when you're in consumer electronics or car. Any difference on in terms of what memory you can use with each one of these architectures? Uh, yes. If you look at, um, and this is more uh, driven by, is it in the data center plugged into the hydroelectric plant or is it plugged into a battery? But in the data center, you know, the cost of HBM, uh, HBM2 memory uh, is coming down and that, that's very high bandwidth memory. Uh, that is something that we're seeing more and more requirements for over here. Uh, there's also a GDDR6, which um, uh, isn't as scalable as the HBM2 uh, uh, memory, but is also something that, that's used here. Uh, not, you know, we're seeing kind of a move away from DDR in some cases for some of these really high bandwidth systems. Over here, when we're dealing with things, you know, assuming that we're connected to a battery, um, on, the, on that side of things, um, uh, you know, GDDR6, um, LP, DDR5 you know, for the future. Um, not as much on the HBM2 side of things because of power consumption. And both of these are built on top of PCIe, right? That's correct. And what that allows is that you know, most, most of these chips you know, already have a, a PCIe controller on there, PCIe5. And so what that allows you to do is, is basically multiplex and reuse that PHI infrastructure for, for the existing PCIe and also use that for either CXL or C6. Kurt Schuler, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.